Brought to you by headline sponsor, HP. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Hey, welcome back, everyone. We are live in Barcelona for HP Discover 2014. This is theCUBE, our flagship program, where we go out to the events and extract the signal from noise. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Next guest is Rob Stretche, Director of Product Management, HP Storage. Welcome back to theCUBE. Thank you. Great to see you. So storage obviously is always, always highlighted in the earnings call, always highlighted as an area, and storage is not going away. We'd love to, love to talk about storage, because that's all we do is talk about storage and how it's changing. So, got to get your perspective on um, where cloud is changing the game. Obviously the show here is cloud, it's mission critical. Um, 3 par has been a huge success part of HP, but now OpenStack is on the radar. I've had people tell me at the last Amazon event, you know, I trust OpenStack over Amazon mainly because the venture capitalists know what's going on in OpenStack, and there's more enterprise action going on in OpenStack. Obviously even though, you know, Amazon certainly is putting out their own storage in, for their world. So, you got OpenStack, you got on-premise storage, What's, what's going on? Give us the quick tutorial of what's the current state of storage with cloud data center. Sure, so I, I think the great thing about OpenStack is that it's got a lot of momentum. Uh, back in Paris, a couple about a couple weeks back, there was about 9,000 attendees that are actually contributing into OpenStack, almost as large as uh, VMworld was here in Barcelona. So if you look at that, group of people who are actually building into OpenStack as an open source product, and you see how we're able to leverage uh, for that matter from a storage perspective. We actually, into our Helium OpenStack distributions, we put it into the open source community, and that's how it's picked up in Helium. So a lot of it is the momentum, the openness, and giving our customers a lot of uh, choices around how they build their clouds and how they go forward with things like OpenStack. So 9,000 people at the event, that's, yeah, that's sizable. It's significant, it's, uh, and a lot of those people are actually writing op open source code. So it's not just the people who are traveling there. There's a good uh, number, probably about 80%, where it was their first OpenStack event. And I think that shows a lot of the momentum that's picked up, especially here in Europe. Uh, it's always been big in America, uh, again, having choice and looking to build a hybrid cloud, and you'll hear a lot about that from HP in general, about how you have on-prem and off-prem, and how do you marry those two, and a lot of people are looking at OpenStack as being that bridge. So what's the state of OpenStack? Maybe you can help us understand some of the key components, and generally, and then specifically, HP's contributions and roles. Where, where are you guys fitting in? Sure, so for the Juno release, and uh, it's out there actually on, uh, they have a web page that actually tracks who's contributing how much and to what parts of it. Uh, HP contributed for the first time was the largest contributor to OpenStack in the Juno release, which is the J release that just went out. And I think that just shows HP's commitment. Meg's talked about it. Uh, you'll hear more about that over the course of this entire week. But I think that our big contributions from a storage perspective is really in the Cinder, which is the block storage portion of it. Uh, if you think of it, Cinder, Cinder block, kind of the play on words, that's kind of how they try to do it. Uh, we're also working for Kilo, which is the K, K release coming out in April, on things such as Manila. If you think of Manila, what does that sound like? A file folder? Well, it's, it is the file services driver for OpenStack. So you guys did the fiber channel driver for Cinder, right? Correct, uh, we, we did one that works with our 3PAR storage and also works iSCSI with our 3PAR as well as our store virtual product set as well. And then you guys are a, a main or the main contributor, you're saying, for Manila, is that right? Uh, we're one of the main, we are one of the main contributors for Cinder, uh, along with a, a consortium of other uh, vendors that are out there, and we are working with that same consortium on Manila. Manila is actually pretty much uh, leveraging work that was already done in Cinder yeah. and bringing it to the file. So where does side. Swift fit into this? Is, does, was, does Manila essentially replace that? Does it get subsumed into, into Swift? It's an, another it's access. A third? It's a third access methodology. It's pretty much uh, one of the more popular ones that you hear. If you hear, like we were talking, or, you know, Amazon, you kind of contrast Amazon's uh, their API set with Swift. And Swift is kind of that 
uh, S S3 API. Yep. Well, Swift is that for a couple of months. And, and then Cinder would be the the elastic block storage analog. Correct. Right? Exactly. So, yeah. so how should customers think about them? Um, OpenStack more open. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, um, is it is it more functional? Is it will it be more functional? What, what more should we know yeah. about them? So I, I think it's still early on. Mm -hmm. I think you know if you look at the competing things that are out there from VMware, from Microsoft, from Citrix, uh, you know other vendors beyond ourselves who have their own distributions. We have our Helium OpenStack and our OpenStack Community Edition. Uh, there's people like Red Hat, Mirantis, and uh, others like uh, Canonical with their Ubuntu that have very full feature, but proprietary or you know uh, extensions on OpenStack to make it easier. I think OpenStack itself alone is still uh, working through the kinks of getting to be enterprise ready. I think if you're going to go down the OpenStack route, a lot of our customers have actually hired people who are contributing back into the community. Because you need that developer mentality to really get OpenStack going full throttle. So Robert, a lot of people are confused about the business model with OpenStack. They, they hear open and they think, oh, it's like the Duke, nobody's going to make any money, it's all going to be free. But can you talk about the business model, how you guys, because you really don't care if there are different distributions, obviously you want you know, Helion to do do well. But right. Exactly. This is different from a storage standpoint. You want it to be. You want your products, your software licenses, your hardware products to be compatible with anything that's out there. But so you could. Can you talk more about the business model? Sure. Uh, for us, we see a lot of our customers going towards OpenStack, and they're looking at how do they have choice at a hypervisor and at kind of that management control plane. From a, if you think of OpenStack they have the word software-defined storage in there, and they have the word of software-defined control plane, which is the manageability features. Uh, that is done through uh, other things like Nova, which is compute, and that's the driver that does uh, being able to look at the processor and understand how the processor is being utilized and do multi-threading and things of that nature and high availability uh, in concert with you know how it works with our Cinder block driver. So, I think when we look at the business model, we want to be there for our customers if they're going that way. And we see that in a lot of our service provider customers, especially here in EMEA, that in Europe they're really looking at, if not implementing, clouds based on this. Uh, at OpenStack in, uh, in Paris a couple of weeks ago, I was with one of our Japanese service provider customers, and they were really talking about how they were moving, uh, they were back on a earlier release of OpenStack uh, on the F release, uh, was, was called Fulsome, but they were looking at how do they go, and I think up until recently, upgrading was a problem, so from a business model for us, what we see is we're interacting with those early customers, early adopters, to build in the different features that, you know, frankly, VMware has there today, um, but VMware costs you money, and I think it's a balance between open truly open and going and just downloading the distribution off of the OpenStack.org website or and building your own or going to somebody like a Helion OpenStack and getting a fully supported version or a Red Hat or Mirantis or one of those or are you going to go and stick with VMware and I think it really has to do with the business model of our customers and their operational stance and what their cost model looks like. And, and, and where the leverage is, right? I mean, when you talk to VMware, you're at VMware, they say, oh, we love, we love OpenStack, we're all in, blah, right. blah, blah, but, but customers, like you said, want choice. You actually use the term hypervisor choice. Right. Choice to me means you know, pricing leverage, you know, Absolutely. pricing power, options. So I mean, essentially, OpenStack, VMware, Amazon, these are competing entities, largely. I mean, yeah, yes, yeah. there's complementary aspects, and certainly people are going to use all three, but right. OpenStack is largely an alternative to those, is it not? Yeah, yeah, and I, I think, you know, and VMware was at OpenStack in Paris, uh, along with several others who would be considered competing, but I think you look at Amazon as kind of the outlier as closed and proprietary on their gear, for that matter. Um, they're doing some things to open it up a little bit, uh, but I, I kind of look at it as, VMware has a lot of the full feature, the richness out there today. Mm -hmm. uh, where OpenStack is going, they want to get there based on the KVM, the kernel virtualization uh, 
hypervisor that's in Linux. And if you look at it longer term, uh, you know, VMware is talking about how you'll use vCenter to control OpenStack and be that management control plane. And I think that's where interesting things will happen is that, that management layer. And it will be interesting to see how it all shifts from well, what can we learn from other open source? I mean, you remember the Linux Unix Absolutely. discussions. Oh, well, Unix is so much more functional. You know, yeah. those days are gone. So, to right. project ten years out. Why wouldn't OpenStack have the same rich functionality as uh, Amazon or a, or a VMware? I think it will. I think it, you know, honestly, it's good for VMware customers as well as people looking at OpenStack because I think it's pushing innovation. And if I look at where we want to take it from a Helium perspective and what we're doing on our storage side, it's about driving the enabling technology, but that just means that VMware has to go that much faster to stay ahead with the richness. Uh, and I think it's, you know, what we're seeing, you know, also that we've learned in the hyper-converged spaces, it comes back to simplicity. And I think right now, OpenStack is not simple. And it comes down to uh, a customer that can't hire OpenStack-based engineers is not going to be able to do OpenStack very well. They're not going to be able to keep up with the distributions, the packages, the updates, they're not going to be in the stream. It's going to be tough for them. Mm -hmm. They're going to look to a vendor like ourselves with our Helium OpenStack or to somebody like a Red Hat or others to really keep them up to date and to bring that simplicity. Um, but still, the feature richness is going to come from people innovating around the ecosystem. And I think there's a play there for VMware too, longer term. And I think it, it all depends on where they go with ESX, I, and vSphere, and how, how do they really embrace it or do they not? And I think they, uh, they do have a play there though. The question that I want to ask you is on OpenStack Europe versus the US. Um, obviously the Paris show, mm -hmm. not well attended by standards in the US. Obviously the Silicon right. Valley event was learning just through for the industry, with the industry was packed house. Right. Cube was there, we had a great time. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a travel, it's a pretty big travel, but it's a different focus. I've heard people say, a lot of telco conversations. Uh, what's different? What happened in Paris and what's happening here that's different in, than North America? Because yeah. Yeah, you hear about the same, oh, enterprise here, here in Europe's a little bit different. What are you seeing as different kinds yeah. of conversations? Yeah, the conversations do, especially in the cloud space, tend to be different in Europe than they are in the States. A lot, a lot of telco conversations, and uh, you know, you would kind of look at it as smaller telco or clouds, and I think a lot more of them. It's more fragmented market over here, because you have so many countries with so many different laws, even though the EU uh, permeates around, but they still have different cloud pockets of clouds that have allowed people to uptake. But I think what they have learned is that adopting things like OpenStack and moving rapidly towards an open architecture can help them on their cost curve. And I think that's uh, where OpenStack in Paris was uh, a lot more geared towards getting work done on the standard itself versus being uh, the trade show aspect of it. Uh, although, and a lot of nuts and bolts being talked about. A lot, of, a lot of nuts and bolts being turned and talked about, and I think a lot of people figuring out, okay, this is the best way for me to proceed forward with that as well. So a lot of people have questioned the progress of OpenStack, obviously. Um, there's pros and cons, consolidation. You're seeing cloud scaling was acquired by EMC, Randy's right. company. Some say at a yard sale. Um, um, you know, I've known, we've known Randy, guest, guest of the Cube many times, always dynamic to talk to. Uh, obviously, other acquisitions you saw, um, Josh McKenty go to Piston, right. who's the founder. So, it's a lot. so oh yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. HP Eucalyptus. HP right. Eucalyptus yeah, exactly. with Martin. So, you know, consolidation is always good. You're just going to see some, I think, I think some good progress here. So I want to get your take, not so much what's going on in the scuttlebutt in the industry. We have a good handle on that. Happy to report that at another time. But inside HP, I'm almost imagining, as if I'm inside HP, that similar conversations are happening inside with senior management and down in the, in the trenches. Um, obviously, Cloud Group is well-funded. We've seen them at all the events. Uh, Monty's awesome, he's on the board. We have um, you know, two HP board members up there. Uh, awesome people, interviewed on theCUBE as well. So, big big bet on OpenStack. Big, big but bet, you're in the storage yeah. group. So, have the fiefdoms talking to each other? What is the conversation inside HP? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And no, tell us the truth. No, that's that's great, and I, I think, that <laughs> I, I think you're, it's very accurate. And, uh, a lot of my team's uh, work from a software-defined storage perspective, is working across those groups, be it with 
our cloud team, or be it with our converged systems team, uh, or be it you know with the server team straight out. And I think what's nice about that is really uh, the fiefdoms have been breaking down. And I think what we're trying to do is really coordinate across the different uh, business units so that we can make sure that hey, when we're building something for OpenStack, there's a business reason and justification that the cloud group sees out of it as well as ourselves. And that we're doing the right things at the right time. So we're helping them on the standards, they're helping us with the standards because they see it at a much broader level of where that entire OpenStack business is moving. We're there to kind of help support and make sure that as one HP we can get there. And I think that's the important part. So given that, this code leaderboard issue always comes up. We're number one. Red Hat might right. debate that and say, no, they're number one. They only work on patches. Um, what defines number one? I mean, give us some, yeah. give us a taste. I mean, are you including every single code contribution, including QA, or is it core code? I mean, is what 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 defines yep. that? So I was including everything, right, yeah. all over the top. And I, I think that to your point, uh, you know, when you look at the top four, we're all in about the same space from that perspective between us, uh, Red Hat, and IBM, and some of the others are out there really contributing. And I think it just speaks to it being a great way for us to move that standard forward. And um, I don't get as hung up on the leaderboard as the progress we're making with our customers and seeing them implement it and actually leverage the technology. It's really more of pimping up the fact that you guys are big contributors. A absolutely. And not, and not an insignificant player at all. Right. That's main, the main I, I think that, that is uh, nail on the head right there. Is yeah. that. Rob, I wonder if you could talk about each software-defined strategy. It's, everybody's software-defined everything these right. days, and, and you're an expert. You, you live the software-defined life, according to your LinkedIn profile, I love it. Um, but so you have a lot of different strategies out there. You're seeing EMC say, okay, we're going to separate the control plane from the data plane. Essentially, right. putting in a layer so they can bridge the old with the new. Okay, cool, we get it. You got NetApp saying, hey, we're going the whole thing. Here it is, go right. nuts. Big big risk, Hail Mary, you know, yeah. <laughs> big play. Okay, got it. What's HP's strategy around software defined? I wonder if you could sort of crisply articulate that for our audience. Absolutely, and I think it comes back to, uh, we do believe in a control plane or a management plane and data services. And as you would hear David Scott talk about it, we really look at it as being unified data services across our platforms, not just software defined, but across the service refined or SLA oriented ones. And our cost optimized is really where we see software defined fitting. For people who want to go wide, if you want to go deep, we have our three par, you know, best price per square meter of data center space that you can get steep and deep. When you want to you know, scale out and scale up, that's really going to be cost optimized and software defined. And we look at that from a data services layer as really being our store virtual and our store once VSA product set. Uh, where we look at it from a controller management plane is we're going to play with Microsoft's, we're going to play with VMware's control planes. They have their vSphere control plane, Microsoft has their SCVMM control plane, or what they would claim is their control plane, and we're going to play with OpenStack. We kind of look at the interface for that is really going to be one view in the long term, and how we go to market uh, as at one HP is leveraging the power of OneView to interact in all of those different control plane areas. So, okay, so then my follow-up on that is related to the three-par piece. So, three-par, I mean, scale up, scale out, I mean, essentially, right. is really what you're talking about here. Um, do you see over time the sort of three-par functionality, I mean, doing stuff in, in Cinder, Right. Uh, that's software defined. Do you see that functionality trickling into the software defined umbrella? A ab absolutely. Uh, we look at uh, bringing those services, uh, for instance, our adaptive optimization, which was uh, doing the automated tiering uh, at a chunklet level mm -hmm. underneath the hood inside 3PAR. We brought that over about a year and a half ago to our store virtual platform. And now we're doing even more to bridge that uh, that divide, I guess you could say, between that SLA optimized and the cost optimized, bringing 3PAR and Store Virtual closer together. Uh, we'll have some announcements uh, here in Barcelona later today around uh, some of our functionality bridging Store Once and 3PAR as well. And that's going to be really exciting. And we kind of look at that as a way to get out there 
and bridge the gap between what had been, you know, quote unquote, physically constrained, and how do you bring that broader for people who may not need a three par, but they want that full, rich set of features, absolutely. And, and I think another area of confusion in software defined is, is people say, oh, well, it's, it's all software, so it must be software defined, but I think of it as more than that. I mean, and I wonder if you could weigh in. But the ability to, through an API, yeah. programmatically provision infrastructure and deliver an SLA and change that SLA, you know, Ab through absolutely. code uh, and automate that. I mean, that to me is software defined. Is that a fair sort of way to think about it? And I wonder if you could add I, some color to that. I think that's a uh, great way of breaking it down for the customers. And a lot of what we talk about is how do you have REST-based APIs that are published open APIs so that if you're using OpenStack, if you're using VMware, you know that there's going to be a way to do integrations. Or if you are out there and want to write directly against those APIs because you have a particular application and business need that needs to, say, take a snapshot at a certain time during the day at a certain interval, we provide that out to our customers in that REST-based API, which is using you know, web-based technology. Uh, I think that what you'll find is that we look at the control plane as being a place that we need to be able to play in a lot of different environments. And I think that is really why we've taken that more open approach to the control plane uh, versus saying, hey, you have to buy our control plane and our control plane only. So, so software companies, Rob, they always want to commoditize hardware. Right? That's what good software companies do. Right? Oh, it's, it's just hardware. Yeah. Put the value into our software stack. So you're sort of used to that with Microsoft, VMware now with with vSAN is, is taking a similar path, but storage has always been really hard. Right. Uh, and that's been sort of a heat shield against the commoditization trend. With software defined, does that change? How do storage companies preserve margins uh, in this sort of software defined world? Is it just adding more function? Is it making it up in volume? I wonder if you could talk about that. Well, well if you, I mean, I, I think it's a good, I'll give you kind of an example. If you look at our three part development team, the vast majority of them are software engineers. 3PAR is software defined, software defined inside the box, mm -hmm. it's just hardware enabled. And I think it's the difference that there are going to be certain things that you need hardware for to actually increase the performance of that or do special features and things of that nature that just can't be done uh, based on the process. We have a long relationship with Intel and we do some co-development with them and we look at how do we leverage those but at a certain point, you know, the ASIC that's in the three part does some special stuff that you really just can't get at scale to maximize that data center space like you can with a three part system. Software will have the features, but you know, it may not scale to the same way uh, that a three part system can from a density perspective, especially. Well, I, gotta, I gotta ask the R&D question. Where's the developers coming from? Inside the storage group, cloud group, and can you comment, we're seeing some comments on crowd chat in the crowd about HP Labs not having anything under the, under the table with OpenStack. No mention of OpenStack and HP Labs. Uh, so, so is HP yeah. Labs doing any R&D? Are you guys doing any? So, so you can kind of look at... Uh, or is it all being done in the open? It's, <laughs> it's all being done in the open from a perspective that there is innovation going on at HP Labs, but that's usually a further out type of uh, approach where they're doing things now that will show up five years from now in productization. Uh, where Specifically to OpenStack. And, and yeah, stuff that can be leveraged into OpenStack. So you know of stuff that. going on in HP Labs that's OpenStack related? There, there is stuff in HP Labs that's OpenStack related, Okay, yes. that's good, that's what I so, get that out there. Yes. So uh, folks out there, HP yeah. Labs is working on stuff. <laughs> You know, they, they yeah, work on without, stuff. Without without being specific about it. But well, we usually are, HP yeah. Labs has got the propeller heads. Right. They're doing some really cutting edge, really far out there. Yeah, Probably absolutely. imagine around power and cooling, software, yeah. weirdness, mem memsters, all that stuff. Yes, yeah, and, and if, I think you look at it and how do you deal with, because at the, at the end of the day, software still sits on hardware. I don't care if it's a server or a yeah. purpose-built uh, three-part array, you still have software on hardware. And we happen to be a fully full stack integrated company where we know what's going on at the hardware level. So what about open compute? Obviously we cover that show as well. We love we love open compute. It's got the same ethos as open source. Um, some say there's really not a lot of meat in the bone there, yeah. only for high-end dudes doing their stuff. 
at large scale, whether it's own build your own telcos. Uh, what is the sta status there? Because obviously, it seems like a perfect fit with OpenStack. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I look at Open Compute as being, it, it has to make sense. And I think it goes back to, are you going to build your own? Are you gonna, do, you have the, do you have a core business that if you go and build your own servers, that that's going to lower your operational costs or give you an operational advantage over your competitor? Those are the people who go to open compute. I think for the vast majority of people, buying a server at cost and seeing the cost you know, continually coming down from that perspective as the processing power goes up will be great. And I think open compute kind of will play a role, but not as a significant role as OpenStack. Rob, really appreciate you coming on. Quickly get you the final word in. What's the big announcements on, on your Converge and your software-defined storage? Give us a taste of sure. what you guys are talking about. Sure, so we were talking about hyper-converged. We launched our CS200 uh, families where we announced our store virtual and our Evo line. And we'll be talking about uh, announcing and shipping our store virtual uh, CS200 uh, later today. Okay, we are here live on theCUBE here in Barcelona in Spain, covering HP's European customer event, uh, annual show here in Europe. Obviously, great attendance, record attendance again. And uh, we are here inside theCUBE, getting all the data, sharing that with you. Join the conversation on CrowdChat, crowdchat.net slash HP Discover. Log in, be part of the on the record conversation. Uh, we'll field some questions from there and, and be, be part of the crowd and join theCUBE, join HP Discover. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>